birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Chiga. Happy birthday to you. Hey, very good, very good. We were going to have a uh, bagel with a candle on it, but couldn't find a candle. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so Chiga, what birthday is this? Uh, 42. 42. <laughs> Man, you uh, <laughs> don't look at it. Don't look at day over 40. Okay. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> turn these off. We will now proceed with the lecture as planned. Look at this. Isn't that a pretty picture? This is what this is one of my favorite artists, Caspar David Friedrich, Mann und Frau. De Mont betrachten. And as you see, Mann und Frau are not there. Mann und Frau are actually over here somewhere. Uh, but this is <laughs> kind of interesting because it's an example of combined stress, no doubt. Uh, a, a tree, if it were vertical like these uh, pine trees in the background, it would be primarily axially loaded, forced straight down the trunk. But uh, due to uh, probably some uh, large squirrel that undermined the root system, the thing's tipped over, so as it, as it uh, tips, it become, begins to act like a cantilever, right? So what is it? Is it a cantilever, or is it a column, or a cantilever? Oh, so, see, trick question. If you're going to analyze this with what you know so far, what would you do? Uh, analyze it as a, col as a cantilever, or as a column, or, uh, see, it's somewhere halfway between. In fact, it's almost exactly half, well, if it were 45 degrees, don't you think it would be kind of halfway between? Uh, it would be uh, definitely in flexure as a cantilever, uh, but still with a, you know, at least half of its axial load on it. So you have to somehow, somehow combine those stresses, and that's what, that's what this chapter is supposed to be about. Um, this case, a pure axial stress we've looked at. In the columns, in, you know, we did chapter 18 quite a bit earlier. Well, okay. Could I say hello? <laughs> um, right. Here is a pure axial uh, force. It passes directly through the, the centroid. That was a proviso uh, of columns when we, you know, when we, um, well, hey, when you did your, your towers, right, you had to be as careful as can be to try to get that load dead centered. And you know, if that load started to get off center a little bit, it made a big difference. It, the thing, you know, started to tip uh, much more readily than if you could keep that load balanced. You know, if you loaded up, you know, say, you, say it was here and you just started stacking all. No, that would be, oh, what a stupid thing. You wouldn't do that because it would immediately uh, add this tipping force. It would add a, a flexural force. Um, Let's see, I need two things. I need this light on, I think. Well, wait a minute, let me, let me see. Maybe we'll just turn the big lights on. This is, this is the, uh, the case with this load that's now become eccentric. The E stands for eccentric. It means it's off center. Uh, might not be quite at the edge there, but even anywhere along here, anywhere off of this, even if it were attached at the, you know, at the edge here, it would have a, an offset, and that offset is uh, gives it a moment arm. You can imagine, here now you can turn the lights on. You can imagine if I, if I loaded this beam over here on, on this side, it's going, to, it's going to have a tendency to, to bend. It, that, it's the same, doing this is the same as doing this, is twisting it. Because that force, that uh, downward force, You know, this, if I put it over here at the edge, it has, a, has a, uh, an offset. And that, this force times this distance uh, equates to a, a bending moment, right? Equals that moment. It's a twisting. Now, you can, you can the, the axial force is still there. It's not like this is, is pure. 
uh, flexure. And you can see this, let's see, by a little game. Say you had that, and then you, then you added uh, a pair of forces here in the center. Let's see if I do this right. Okay, now you now you'd still have the uh, still have the same condition, right? I haven't changed anything. This forms a couple, so that force this would be a pure a pure moment, but I I have this left over, so it it ends up being the addition of the two. Does that make sense? I mean, if I had this little game I just played, I mean, if I had done it without that other load on there. Well, what's that? Nothing, right? These would just cancel out. But here they don't cancel out. I mean, here there's another force, this force over here that combines with this to form the moment. So you have this then actually is, is the force plus the, the moment. It's both of them. You've got both of them together. So you have to, so that, that has, just because I put the load on the on the side over here, it does definitely have the flexure, but it still has it still has in fact the same downward force. Whatever this downward force is, that axial force is still there. It's just the axial force plus something. So you can see right off, <clears throat> it's not something you'd strive to do, or it's something you'd strive maybe to avoid. If you had a column you'd want to do everything you could to axially load it. Maybe instead of loading it here, you could load it here, right? A attach the bolted beam here, and that would, that would bring it closer to the center. Or, you know, what you could do, you can't always avoid it, but, but it is just adding that additional moment that otherwise you wouldn't have to carry. Now, here, turn the, turn the lights back off, I guess. Let's see how we account for that. This this is the stress from because you've got the you've got this this uh, P force and the M force, right? You've got the moment and the and the the uh, axial load. So each of those causes a stress. The the stress from the axial load was P over A. The stress from the moment is M C over I. So to get the total stress because you've got both the loads on there, uh, to get the total stress you need to add these up, <clears throat> add them or potentially subtract. Because remember, this is, it, if this were a, an axial force, it would put the entire section into compression. But a moment like this would put this side in compression and this side into tension. So it, it, the tension is the opposite sign, the opposite effect from the compression. So on, on this side, they'd subtract. On this side, they'd add. Right? That's why it's plus or minus. So when you do these, the stress is not going to be even. If it were just the uh, concentric axial force, then the stress would be uh, uniform nearly across the, the uh, area, across the surface, the section. But when you, when, you add the, when you have the moment in there, the moment has that distribution where it's uh, a maximum at the extreme fibers, right? compression on this side to zero in the middle and tension on this side. Now, if you're looking at the stresses um, and trying to decide what the, the, um, um, whether it's allowable or you know, what the capacity is, uh, you ha each of these have probably different allowables. The axial stress uh, usually has a lower allowable than the flexure stress, or you know, depending on the slenderness of it, uh, columns usually are in more, more danger of buckling than a beam would be. Um, so, yeah, they have, different, they have different allowable stresses to account, so that it's not like you can easily just say, you know, come up with a total stress and then compare it to an allowable like we've done before. You have to break it into pieces when you actually uh, compare this. So you have to get this stress here and compare it to that allowable stress, this stress here, the flexure, and compare it to the allowable for the flexure. Uh, by, by setting up this ratio, these become like 
percentages of utilization almost. You can imagine if this were, um, if this stress, this stress actually equaled the allowable stress, it would be 100% maxed out, right? And that value would be 1.0, which would represent 100%. If this, if the allow, if the actual stress were only half of the allowable, then this value would be 0.5, or 50% of the total capacity. And and the same for this one. So they, when they add up, they can't they can't sum more than 1.0 or 100%. So you take the in terms of of finding out whether it's um, how the stress relates to the capacity of the, the beam to carry stress, the stress capacity, uh, then you do it by percentages. The percentage that's in axial stress, the percentage that's in bending. You could even have other stresses on there. I mean, you, sometimes uh, this could be bending in different axes. If right now this is pure, the way it's drawn is pure uh, x-axis bending, right? It's bending about the strong axis. If I uh, ran it off on this axis, it would be y-axis bending. If I went off here somewhere, say I had the load right on that corner, then it would be both x and y. It would have a tendency to bend about the x-axis and the y-axis. So you'd have two, two moments. You'd have an x moment and a, y, and a, a y moment. And then you'd have another, another you know, term in there. That you, but you just add, but pr in principle, you add them up the same. Whoops, I think that was the wrong way, wasn't it? Okay, one more. Okay, so here's how they, here's how they add up <coughs> and in terms of the stress diagrams. And it, you'll see it makes a difference how far out you go. If you uh, right on this uh, axis, the centroidal axis, then if everything were straight and perfect, you'd have a uniform stress. This is what we assumed with the columns that we've done so far. That, uh, and this is the simple P over A type stress. Right? This P is distributed over A and gives you this stress, this stress value here. So that would be the, the P over A. Now as you start to move off like this, you pick up a moment, the P, P times eccentricity. And that moment, if we draw it in terms of tension, these arrows are going downward, these are going upward like this. So this is compression. If the moment on this side is like this, so this side goes into tension, that's the tension. This side goes into compression, that's the compression. And this is the neutral axis right here. Right at the, right at the neutral axis, you've got no uh, flexural stress. So this value is just what's, what was there from the axial stress. But as you go this way, you add on this compressive stress. So this gets added, right? So by the time you get to this, you've got this one plus this one. So it's quite a bit larger. As you go this way, this is the tensile side of the moment. These are subtracting from this. So if these happen to be equal, which that's the significance of this ratio here, uh, that's the point at which they're equal at the, if this is 1 -sixth, over or at the third point, right? This is the, the middle third then. Uh, this, these go exactly to zero. So if I'm back here, if I went back this way, the closer I come here, the smaller these values get, which would mean I'd pick up a, this, this tensile force would be smaller than the axial force and I'd, I'd have a, a compression value down here. But right at that point, that, that uh, sixth point, then this is equal to that and those balance out. These two balance out and that would be zero. So then you have the significance of that point is it's at the, the point, it's the, the most, the, the border of eccentricity or the, the most eccentric point where the, the uh, section is still entirely in compression. As soon as I go further, then this tensile force gets bigger than the compressive force and you get, the, you get this case. So here's, here's where it's moved beyond that. This is the, and these are kind of the scale. This is the, uh, uh, this, this remains constant. So this stress remains constant, right? In this comparison, from here to here to here, I've got the same P, let's say. So this, 
this, the axial level is all constant. But because I'm moving the force further out, m keeps getting bigger and bigger. E gets bigger. Here E is just that little bit. Now E's like double the amount. So E, this moment gets bigger. If the moment gets bigger, then the, the stress gets bigger, right? The, these two values remain constant. This would equal, uh, be used as S, right? Uh, I over C could be S. Uh, and that's just a section property. But uh, the moment changes. The moment's getting bigger. So this is, this is increasing. So the compression goes up, but more interestingly, the, you, the tensile value overpowers the, the compressive stress here, and you get tensile stress on this side. So it's actually, even though it's a column, which you'd think is kind of a compressive thing, if you put that load out beyond the, the sixth point, is it, it gets over here, then, then you actually get a tensile force over here. This, there's another application of this same thing. Here, turn that on, which is, I guess, more, um, more common or um, has more application. I don't know. Uh, in this sense, with a column, it probably isn't that significant. But it's the same, it's the same principle that you use with um, a foundation, a spread foundation or a, a footing that, that's on soil. If this were a... If this were a column with a force, and this were the foundation, some sort of a, a um, sp spread footing or something, uh, if you had it right on the, the uh, centroid, the centroid of the foundation, in other words, say if it's a square foundation, you had it right, the column, dead in the center of the square, then this would, then this would be uh, uh, bearing on the soil. Uh, it, in an even fashion, you know, the soil and the, um, would support it in compression. It would be completely in compression. As you start to move over, right, if I put it, well, if I put it at that sixth point uh, in here, and this is called, this actually has a, in foundation design, uh, has a name. This, this is called, this area here, is called the either the middle third. Let me spell middle. L E or E L? No, must be L E. E L? I'm not very good with L E's like that. Good. I had it the other way. <laughs> okay, you're gonna have to correct that on the video. It looks stupid. All right, either the middle third or the cairn actually has a name, look at that, which means the middle third, <laughs> which means it's the middle part, the core, the cairn. <clears throat> and that, if, if the column is placed within that, that middle third, then it's bearing entirely in compression on the soil beneath it. If you move that column off the cairn, so say you get the, the column over here for some reason, that would not be a good idea because that'll mean then you'll have a, a stress distribution that includes some tension, right? So you'd have, you'd have this acting in compression. And of course, the tensile part, the soil's not going to be able to bear tension, which means you just lose it. You can picture it, another way to picture this, which I'd love to love to try sometimes, but I, I've never actually done it. I'll have to do this with my kids someday, is put him on a raft in the water and, and make him walk out to the end. And I think if you pat, it, as long as you're in that middle third, certainly the raft it would be uh, stable in the water. If you pass out of that middle third, it seems to me at that point the raft should lift out of the water. It, it, I mean, taking the dead load of the raft out of it. So I'd have to have a super, a weightless raft right? And, and then you, you move to the third. Even if the way, or if I had the raft weigh a little bit, uh, then you'd have to move a little bit further than the third because the weight of the raft is, is changing. It would be the sum of the, the downward forces, right? Whatever. But it seems like, and you can, I, I mean, seems like maybe you'd have experienced this, 
that the raft does tip, certainly. I think the, the, the other edge comes free of the water. Isn't that an image like you've seen in a cartoon somewhere of, um, of a cat walking to the end of the raft and it goes like this or a bunny rabbit or something and there's water dripping over here? I think that's sort of a, an image. But I'd like to have a photograph of it, actually. But we'll have to work on that for next year. Anyway, uh, it's the same principle as the, the foundation. That it, if, it, if you reach that point, then you can't count on this. This isn't doing you any good in terms of, of supporting the, 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 lo the load of the, the column. So you have to, usually that's written into codes that the, the columns have to be placed in that middle third range. And that's why, I mean, to, to get uh, a bearing on the foundation. But you can see even so, if you bring it off center, it's also not very good because you're overloading. You could put a heavier load than the soil might bear somewhere. And then some of it's not really loaded very heavily. It's not evenly loaded. So you, you can, <laughs> you'd expect you'd get a little bit of. All right, well, so enough said about that, I suppose. What else can we say about these things? Maybe an example. Somewhere in here there's an example. Ah, yes. What, what do you know? An example. This is, although you wouldn't believe it, this is an example out of our very own textbook and represents what seems to be some sort of an awning. So you can picture this as a building here maybe. And here's a, here's a cable supporting the end of this beam. And there's probably, I don't know, some, something going along here, a floor, floor framing system that um, uh, or a roof framing system that puts point loads here, you know, so there's probably, so it looks like, it looks like this, right? It's hanging, mm. okay, maybe it looks like this. Here, hold that in. Okay, he's the building over there. No, just the end. <laughs> he's the building over here. So then there's this cable here, and there's, there's probably a couple of beams like that, and then there's a floor system that runs, or a roof system that runs spans like that. So I end up with point loads here, and there's a little bit of one on the end, right? You got the picture? Yeah, good. OK, so there it is. And uh, with this cable pulling back on it, you can imagine, I mean, it's pulling, right, for heaven's sake. So it's got to be putting this into compression. Clear? Absolutely. All right, but it's pulling at an angle. If, if this thing moved, if I could. It's, locate it straight up there, it would be pulling straight up. And then it would have absolutely no uh, horizontal force. If it came down, you know, maybe at 45 degrees, it would have half of it. I mean, it would be, the vector would be, the vector's going to be in the direction of the, the cable, right? I can't, if it's just a cable, all it can do is pull in tension. There can be no, uh, the, the force in that cable has to be exactly in line with the cable. It has to be axial. This is the same with the trusses, remember? Oh, think way back. Trusses were just like this. So this is just like analyzing a piece of a truss, essentially, uh, in terms of the, the vector part of it. This force comes straight out here. So the components of this force in the cable are going to be at the same um, ratio as the slope of the cable. So in this case, it's this, is, it's this triangle right here, right? So it's this ratio of horizontal to this ratio of vertical. That's what that, so that's the way that is there. Uh, this one, these two forces are the only horizontal forces on the, on the picture, right? This is all external forces. I haven't cut it anywhere. So these two forces must have to balance. Whatever this one ends up, this one has to balance it. So you're going to have you know, a, a force in the cable that divides into these two vectors. You figure out what that is. That's going to have to balance that. Okay. Or you could go backwards. You could some moments. I mean, the, there are only two horizontal forces here. These are, these are known, right? This one's not known. You got one, two, three, four unknowns. But these two, these two line up. So if I sum moments about, say, what did I sum moments about? A. <laughs> yeah, about A. If I sum moments about A, then these two forces pass through A. That one and that one. This force passes through A, and this would be my only unknown, the B horizontal. So that's what this is. That's OK, that's what I ended up doing. There's, uh, this is the B horizontal times, here's the 6 feet. That's that moment arm. And then these are each of the, the 10 and the 10 and the 5 times their moment arms. 
that gives me that gives me this horizontal force. Okay, there's 60 kips there. So I'm just trying I'm trying to I have to find two forces on this beam, the axial force, which I think I just found, and the the flexural force. It's got an axial force and a flexural force. This is causing the flexural force, well not that one, but these two, right, in bending. That's like a beam. And this is this is the axial force that's coming it's balancing this cable force up here. If I wanted to go ahead, I think I went ahead and found the cable forces. Okay, why not? So this this thing gives me the um, this balances this, or I sum moments about the other end and get the same thing. Then they check out. I could also get the the vertical component. I don't know why I need that, but maybe um, that's 15, right? By this ratio, just by the ratio of the slope. Okay. So so far now I've got all the I've got all the reactions. Oh, I had to get this one maybe. That gets this then. Mm, you can get by summing summing verticals. Once you have this one, then the only vertical left is that one. Okay, so that gives me all the end reactions. I've got all the end reactions. The whole thing's uh, statically determinant. Now I want to find the flexor and the axial force in that, and find the stresses. So here we have it. These are the forces. This was the axial force that came from that, that uh, B horizontal, right? Which, by the way, was also that it, it equaled the horizontal force in the cable. At the other end is the other. I mean, I could have cut a, uh, a free body diagram and left the cable out, right? If I cut the cable, if I had cut the cable down here instead of way up there, then I would have had 60 in this way and balanced by the 60 this way. So they are, there is that 60 opposed by a 60 at the other end. That is the axial force. The moment, <coughs> this is third point uh, loading, point loads. Uh, so that comes out to be 10 times, this would be, this is, uh, what is this? 24 was the length. Uh, L divided by, 24 divided by three is eight. So that's where the eight is. And that gives me 80 kip feet. OK, so I got 80 kip feet. That's the moment. And I've got an axial force of 60. So I can go ahead and find the stresses. So the axial stress is P over A. This is, there's the P. And the A is the area. OK, so there's the area. That gives me 6, six KSI. The other one, the flexural force, M over S, or MC over I, but we'll use M over S since we got the S here somewhere. That came out of, say, a table for this steel section. OK, that would be, this is in kip feet. Put it into inches. OK, divided by the section modulus is 19.75 KSI. So now you can combine them. You can just add those stresses, uh, add them uh, for the top side. This would be on the top side in compression. They'd add, and you'd get 25.75 KSI. You could add them on the bottom, or oops, they'd subtract. This is the tensile force from the, um, from the flexure. So it would subtract there, and you get, whoa, actually, uh, the moment is bigger, right? So it, goes, it would be tension. Um, this would be 13.75 tension on the bottom. Now, if you wanted to. Um, Make some sort of a decision where that, oh, turn, turn the big light on, in fact. This is always so hard to see on the board. I can't even see it on the board with that. Um, whether, that's, whether that's passing or failing, let's see here. What do we have? We had the, the little, the axial was 6. 6.0, okay. KSI and the the bending 19.75 KSI. The allowables. Where would we get those? This in in, in what you've done with Engel, he pretty much gives you the allowables. That's a that's a disappointing part about this course. I mean, he just gives you the allowables, but. If you had one of these, you could look up the allowable for steel. 
or you know whatever your material would uh, w was would be could be uh, you could get the allowable out of out of that out of that code and in the uh, steel manual for axial stress well, maybe I put a marker in here there's a there's a nice little table I think we looked at it in fact when we did the columns that that relates the uh, slenderness ratio to an allowable stress because the for for uh, this one for axial you've got you've got to sit the curve mm, you know is this thing it's basically the Euler curve and this is the slenderness ratio and this is the uh, the stress so you know where you are where you are on this on this curve depends on the slenderness ratio. So given the slenderness ratio, you can, you can pick a value of, of stress, so you can pick the, the allowable value. So that's basically what, what they do. They give you a chart, and you figure out the slenderness ratio. For this one, uh, you'd have to look up R, which, in fact, I actually did before class. And the slenderness ratio for, for this thing, assuming the K is Oh, yeah, now here's another thing. You have to decide what L is. And I decided L is going to be braced by whatever these beams are that tie in here. They're given at the point load. Then you might as well make them uh, brace points. And that would, that would happen if it had a deck over it. So they'd have beams and then a deck that would stiffen it so, those, so it wouldn't do this. And then those would act as breast, uh, base point, brace points. So this would be then 96 inches, the 8 feet. And this, you've got a choice of two of those things, right? Either, either a strong axis uh, Rx, which would be in this direction, or an Ry, which would be in this direction. And as a column, it's going to buckle in the weakest direction. It's going to buckle like this. You could, uh, actually, if I wanted to do this more thoroughly, I guess I could have taken the strong axis all the way down for the full length, the, the what is it, 24 feet, and the weak axis on the 8 feet, but I just took the weak axis and hope that was right. Uh, let's see, what is it? 1.53. So this is Y, 1.53, and that gave me a slenderness ratio of... 62. Okay, so that then gives me this value. When I look it up in the table, I think I wrote it down even. 17. Okay, so this is, get the arrow out of there, 17 KSI. That's the allowable. For the, the allowable flexure, ah, the allowable flexure you could get by another table, very interesting table. Where have we seen this before? And let me reiterate one of my favorite tables that uh, um, the table that's used to calculate moments in beams. You could look up, you could find your, your uh, mystery section in there and get the moment and then back calculate the stress. Or you could look up, there's another table where you can look up the, the allowable stresses directly given the section and the bracing and in this case it comes out to be 0 0.6 0 0.6 FY which if we say is uh, use 36 for that which I did for that too by the way um, I get 21.6 so the, the equation here, the FA uh, over FA uh, plus or minus FB over FB, right, would equal, not 17, 6 over 17. And since we're going for uh, the higher value, compression, mm, where did I go? 19.75 over 
21.6. So this is 0.35. Let me put the pieces up there. Plus actually 91, yeah, 914. What'd you say it equal? Which is greater than 1. So, not good. That would exceed the capacity. It's 35% utilized in um, uh, axial stress and 91% in flexure. So you're trying to use 126% of the beam. Looks like a problem. So that one, that one probably wouldn't fly. Or you'd have to... Um, Bigger, bigger section. This is only 36 KSI. You could go to 50 KSI. Maybe, maybe that's what he was thinking. If you went to 50 KSI, you might do it. Or brace it more thoroughly if it were completely braced. So there are other options you could bring in there uh, to get to. But the way I imagined it, it failed. So, but you see, but you see how it adds up. That's the important thing. It's this to this gives you a ratio like that. You have to have these allowables and the actuals, and you compare them, and then it goes over one. OK, so I'm going to turn that back off. Here, now here is a, this is my latest example. Just Saturday, I found this guy out in my backyard and made him stand on this thing. You can see it was a little bit scary, but he did it. He did it. Uh, he was willing to help his papa out. He weighs exactly 45 pounds, okay, and has a vector at this moment that's about like that. So he's supposed to simulate, this was going to be a, uh, maybe a roof rafter or something, and he is uh, a workman standing on this rafter that weighs 45 pounds. It's a lightweight fellow. Now, in terms of flexure, the flexure is actually normal uh, to this. That is, that's this force and this component would be axial. So I have to break his vertical for it. And I think, I think we did a problem. Like this was probably the very first problem in, uh, wasn't it? I think way back in last semester was this problem. Was this problem. Except we, didn't, we just figured the forces. We didn't figure the uh, stresses. So you have to convert his vertical force into a uh, axial force in, the, in this direction, which would be then the, the cosine of 60. Uh, as we've got set up there, if that's really a 30, 60 slope there. So that comes out to be 22 pounds in this direction. In this direction, the vector is 39. So 39 uh, adds up with 22.5 to give the total of 45, which is his gravity load. So I've got, I've got this causing the flexure. Where is that? Uh, there it is. The moment is PL over 4, 39 times 96. This is 90, 96 in this direction, right? Divided by 4. So there's my, my uh, moment in uh, inch pounds. And I can get the MC over I. Here's C. This is a 2 by 4 on its side. So C is half of 1 and a half. So there's C. And I is um, blah, 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 blah. V, D cubed over 12. So there's I. And then that gives me uh, an MC over I of 713. Oh, should have written the units there. That would be PSI. OK, so that's PSI. OK, that's that. The axial force is this one, 22 on the full area. So there's P over A. This is P over A right is is that so i've got this force the axial force this is the the flexural force if i add them together on the compression side then they'd add and i'd get um 717 psi so assuming the allowable is well of course then you that gives you the total stress but you really don't know the allowable like that you'd have to again break it down like we did here to check the allowables but i won't i won't go through that in rafter design, you, you typically don't do this. I mean, if I were going to design a rafter, there's a shortcut that's generally used. And that is, you, you normally take uh, 
you pretend that the beam is a projection, a flat, you, you, act, you, you calculate it as if it were a beam in, in the horizontal projection and uh, neglect the, any axial force. So the, the typical way would be instead of taking this 96 uh, inch length, you'd take this projected length. Okay, that projected length would be somewhere I wrote it down, right? Ah, there it is. That would be the the um, sine sixty times this length, right? The sine sixty times ninety uh, ninety six, I think. Um, or you could get it through proportions. Okay, so it's eighty. Where where to go? Eighty three, eighty three point fourteen. That's this length here. Okay, that in the PL over 4. Then I take his actual vertical force. So I'm, I'm, turn those lights on a minute. What you do, here's the, here's the real one, right? And we had to figure it like that. We took that component. This is the, the projected one. Okay, this is, this is 45, this was 39 actually, right? So if you, take the, if you take the projected length, this length, you can multiply, then, then, it, is, then it is perpendicular to the, the, um, um, the gravity force. So you can go ahead and calculate the moment. Now interestingly enough, the moment from both of these, the moment comes out the same. It's both the same. And the reason is, it's just geometry. Uh, the moment is equal to the, um, um, PL over four, right? See if I do this right. So here, here the P is 45 times the sine 60 in this case, times L. And here I take 45 times L times, because I, I'm taking the projected length, it would be L times the sine 60. Right? So you see they come out the same. They're going to come out the same. Both of them divided by 4. So the moments will come out the same either way you work this. You can work it as a horizontal projection, or you can work it as that, but what you're leaving out and doing it like in doing it like this, I've left out this axial force. Whoa. I'm gonna have to talk to Moji about this. I've left out this axial force. But the axial force in, in a typical roof situation is not really that much. The the lower that slope gets, uh, in fact it gets less and less. You don't usually well, it, it, it's not that big of a component usually because the slopes are pretty low. And, and if you neglect it, in this case, I mean, this is only uh, 4.28 out of, um, not that one, out of this one, 17, seven, uh, 717. What is that? Right, 4.28 out of 717 equals... <laughs> I don't think I wrote that down. Probably not very much. I'm guessing it's going to be less than a percent. It better be. Ah, there we go. Half a percent. So you're only off by half a percent. So you can see it. The, it, the you're not neglecting uh, very much of it. Um, that also has to do with the fact of the the difference in the stresses, right? That you're putting that over the full area, and this is not on the full area. So. So the the amount that gets neglected is is not that not that significant. Here, turn that back off. It's going to drive me crazy. Whoa! Hey, we're almost out of time. Shoot! I was going to show you. Video. All right, here's some other examples real quick of combined stresses um, where this comes up. This is one. Whoa, 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 whoa! This is one uh, a roof truss. Now these are these are would be axially loaded. If I put a if I put a load on it, 
you know that would put the bottom cord into tension. But if I uh, have a bunch of junk up in my attic, that's going to put the bottom cord into flexure. Right? So you've got that bottom core pot cord poten potentially <laughs> is going to be loaded both in flexure and in, in tension. Uh, interestingly enough, the tension would, would tend to uh, relieve the, uh, the compressive force on the flexure side, right? And if that were, if that were dictating, uh, removing this load could actually cause the bottom to fail. Wouldn't that be interesting? I mean, say you had this case. Say you had a real heavy, you, you were up there in um, uh, northern Michigan, what's that place called? UP, and, and uh, they had a real heavy snow load, and, and um, you decided to clean your basement. You moved everything from your basement up to your attic in the middle of winter, and you had it all up there, and everything was fine, and then the snow melted and thawed. The flexure, the, the compressive force would suddenly go up. Well, I mean, suddenly as fast as the snow melted, uh, because you'd no longer have this tensile force in here. So there you'd be happily enjoying your, I mean, when does the snow melt up there? Your July, 4th of July, uh, <laughs> Winnie roast, and your attic would collapse because, because the uh, um, snow melted. So that would not be very much fun. The other thing is, uh, is this other thing we already talked about, but it relates to this perhaps. A P delta. Gosh. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, relates to a P delta effect. And you can look at this. Well, I can explain it in a minute. You can wait that long. Here's a force. Here's a deflection. The force, time, the force, the eccentricity is probably causing this deflection. The force actually uh, times this amount of deflection is causing an additional moment. This force times this deflection here causes a moment, a moment, which is the P delta moment. And that then causes, that, that additional moment causes greater uh, flexure, which causes then more uh, eccentricity. So in other words, you've got, you know, you've got a certain amount of bend uh, because of this that you could calculate from the moment and the, the eccentricity. And that then, as this bows out, uh, you'd pick up an additional moment, this P times the delta moment, and that would make it bow more, which would then increase the delta, which then would increase the P delta moment, so it could potentially be catastrophic, but, but not necessarily. I mean, I mean, like right there, that's not catastrophic. I've got some, some load on it, and it's not, it doesn't just keep moving, it, it, because you, uh, <laughs> It balances, right? It, it uh, uh, converges the, the moments and the, if this, these, these progressively in a series, P1, delta 1, delta 2, delta 3, are, are decreasing, then the thing could, could stabilize. But that would be an additional, the P delta effect is an additional force that, that occurs due to the deformation of the structure. And this would be in any, stru any frame, frame would be another good example, that the frame moves, and then that changes the picture of the forces on the frame because the forces are now in a different relationship to the frame because of the movement of the frame, right? That's fun to calculate. Okay, so that's all for now.